I'd like to have your attention and welcome you all out to uh, our noontime lecture. My name is Doug Anderson. I'm going to be introducing our speakers today. I think you'll be very pleased with uh, this quality of speakers that we have today. We're very excited uh, to present to you. First of all, I want to announce uh, or um, introduce Dr. Richard Miyamoto. Um, Dr. Miyamoto is the Arilla Spence DeVault Professor and Chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Indiana University School of Medicine. And I have to say proudly that he is my chairman, so I trained on, under him, and so I really look up to him and, and continue to admire him and, and hope to, to follow in his footsteps. But he's a great man. But he also um, uh, has received a, a Bachelor of Science degree from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, an MD degree from the University of Mes Michigan, an MS in otology from the University of Southern California. He also completed a residency at Indiana University and a fellowship in otology and neuroautology at the House uh, Ear Institute in Los Angeles. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, the Collegium Otorolingology uh, Amicite uh, Sacrum, and the Roy Royal Society of Medicine in England. He has served on the Advisory Council of the National Institute for Deafness and Other Communication Disorders and has been funded continuously by, by the National Institute of Health for the past 25 years as a principal investigator uh, studying speech perception, speech production, and language in children with cochlear implants. He has also uh, been president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, president of the American Neurotology Society, president of the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, president of the Association of Academic Departments of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, president of the Centurions of the Deafness Research Foundation, and president of the William H. House Society, also president of the Indiana chapter of Alpha Omega uh, Alpha. Also, so with that, I'd like to introduce him, but also he has brought with him um, his audiologist who works with him uh, on cochlear his cochlear implant team. Her name is uh, Michelle Van Gordon, and I was able to meet her last night, and a very, very uh, uh, pleasant person, and we're very excited to have her with us also. She is a, has a doctor of audiology from Missouri State University and graduated from there in May of 2008. She then joined the Indiana University Medical Center cochlear implant team at Riley Hospital for Children in June of 2008. As part of the uh, IU Medical Center cochlear implant team, Michelle works with pediatric and adult cochlear implant candidates and recipients, as well as per participating in FDA clinical trials. So with that, I proudly present Dr. Richard Miyamoto and his audiologist, Michelle Van Gordon. Well, thank you very much, Doug. It's a real pleasure for uh, Michelle and I to be here to represent the uh, team at Indiana University. This has been a uh, long venture for us, uh, going back to uh, starting right after I uh, finished my fellowship in Los Angeles. But uh, our team has been uh, instrumental in helping uh, just establish a concept. It started out uh, as something that uh, shouldn't work, but it's going better and better. Uh, when you have funding from the National Institutes of Health, you want to try to find a project that never ends, and I think we've found one. So this is uh, an ongoing thing that uh, has a tremendous amount of uh, potential, we think. It's a tremendous uh, privilege for us to be here at this Ogden meeting. Uh, this is really unique in the country, I think. Uh, in our state, I don't think we could ever get all the specialties to uh, work together as you have figured out how to do here. I think it's for the betterment of uh, all the physicians who practice in this area here. So we really thank you for this invitation. I wanted to uh, start out by just acknowledging uh, some members of our Coker implant team. It's become large. Uh, when we started out, uh, this didn't exist at all in Indiana University. But uh, I was asked to be part of the uh, first co-investigator team, and our, our workup of deafness, when I first came back to Indiana, was, I'd look at the eardrum, it'd be normal, and our audiologist would test the hearing, it'd be nothing, and we were basically done. Um, if there was not not enough hearing to benefit from a hearing aid, there was nothing that the medical profession had to offer. So this project has uh, really changed things. And we now have uh, 
five and a half clinical audiologists that uh, just take care of our patients. We now have over 2,000 implant patients uh, in our center. And then we have a whole group of uh, researchers who are looking at various uh, issues related to these patients. I don't have any uh, financial relationships, nor does uh, Michelle to disclose to you, but I do serve on uh, the uh, Coker Corporation's Medical Advisory Board. I wanted to start with this uh, slide here. This is a basic slide, but I, I might uh, just mention this. This uh, was published in the New England Journal a few years ago, but it has a, a good uh, illustration of what a Coker implant is. I thought we'd uh, start out just first of all uh, getting some understanding of how the ear functions because uh, this is what we're trying to uh, uh, take advantage of here. But uh, in the normal situation, we have uh, the oracle gather sound and sound waves just come through the ear canal and strike the eardrum. Then the mechanical vibrations are transmitted through three little bones and then um, the vibrations go through the foot plate of the stapes into the cochlea here. Now, we've had for many years the ability to take care of conductive hearing loss. If there's a problem with the ear canal or the eardrum or the little ear bones, we had techniques to uh, take care of this, and that's called a conductive hearing loss. But once uh, sound got beyond that into the inner ear, if the hearing loss couldn't be uh, reached with a standard hearing aid, there was really no treatment. But it wasn't until the cochlear implant came along that there was some way of addressing a, a profound sensory neural hearing loss. Now what we have is a device that um, is trying to take advantage of uh, some of the function that was lost with the little hair cells. Uh, when vibrations come in, the hair cells uh, bend and they send an electrical impulse up the hearing nerve to the brain. So it's from here that uh, we really want to take advantage of uh, some of the tremendous neuroplasticity. We can get signals uh, into the auditory cortex uh, that have enough information, a lot can be done with it. And so this is what the uh, cochlear implant was uh, trying to achieve, is to basically take the function of uh, defective or uh, deficient hair cells. Now, for sure, uh, cochlear implants have turned out to be one of the uh, really great achievements in modern medicine. Um, this is the only uh, device which effectively uh, substitutes for one of our sensory systems. Uh, there are some things that uh, can make some rudimentary changes, but the uh, implant has gone way beyond what anyone would uh, have thought would be possible. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge this quote from Sir Isaac Newton, because it really uh, is apropos to this uh, project. It says, if I have uh, seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And, and this is really true. Uh, there was a long history of people uh, doing much of the basic uh, work that eventually led to the clinical project that we now have. I wanted to start with this uh, slide of uh, electrical stimulation of hearing, because th this is actually an old concept. Uh, way back in uh, 1790, Volta, who uh, developed the battery, uh, stimulated his own ears. He put a metal rod into each ear and put a large current through his head. And uh, he heard a sound that was like sizzling soup. So this uh, idea that electrical stimulation could uh, produce an auditory sensation has been around for a long time. But then I looked, uh, there was probably no further literature for a long time. It wasn't until 1957 that someone actually had the nerve to sort of repeat his experiments. But it's been known that uh, uh, auditory nerves could be stimulated electrically for a long time. Well, diurnal and ears, uh, did uh, a, a simple experiment back in Europe, and they were able to uh, stimulate the auditory nerve and <clears throat> produce a sensation of sound. Now, that was uh, sort of an interesting observation, but um, it wasn't really until that came back to the United States, and three investigators started working with this concept um, uh, in Los Angeles. William House was in Los Angeles, uh, and Blair Simmons was at Stanford, and uh, Robin Michelson was at uh, University of California at San Francisco. But they started uh, some initial work to see if we could develop some sort of implantable cochlear prosthesis. At that time, though, <clears throat> the basic premise by all the uh, neuroscientists in our field was that the odds were just too much against any of these investigators to come up with a uh, solution to this complex problem. If you think about the normal ear has about 30,000 nerve fibers, and these investigators were talking about putting one little squiggly wire with a few electrodes and trying to get enough information to make it worthwhile. And just looked at this whole idea and they thought, 
the goals were just uh, insurmountable and it wasn't going to happen. And so uh, a lot of the leading uh, scientists in our field looked at this very carefully. And uh, this is a picture of Merle Lawrence, who's actually one of my professors uh, when I was a medical student in Michigan. And he concluded uh, way back in the 60s already that uh, direct stimulation of the auditory nerve fibers with the uh, ultimate uh, uh, perception of speech just was not feasible. The goals were just not going to be met. And then in um, uh, Harold Shuknik came out with this statement uh, in the 70s. That's an otology nudes a new operation, but this is not it. And uh, Shuknik was the chairman of the department at Harvard, and he carried a lot of influence in our field. It looked uh, that this just wasn't going to happen. And I, I was uh, a resident while all these things were going on. Uh, most of the leading people in our field just thought that uh, this concept just couldn't be realized. And about this time, uh, William House uh, uh, gave a talk at the American Otological Society, and I remember this very well. He stood up there and said, gentlemen, mark my words, we've entered a new era in otology. And he, he never doubted that uh, the scientists were going to succeed in this. And I had the privilege of being one of Bill House's fellows. Uh, it's in the late 70s that I did this, but I saw all these uh, scientists come in and they thought that uh, the concepts that uh, needed to be uh, addressed just couldn't be met with this. But uh, Bill never gave up and uh, kept working at various things with Jack Urban, who's an engineer at the House Institute. And uh, they came up with something that needed to be explored. There was a fair amount of animal experimentation going on, but it was really decided at that time that uh, the animals weren't going to answer some of the basic questions. Because uh, Bill actually uh, was talking to me, and he, uh, we decided that we didn't have any guinea pigs that could tell us what they heard. Uh, you could do damage studies and some physiologic things, but we really needed some um, information from patients who could describe their own experiences. So right after I came back to Indiana, Bill House uh, announced a national clinical trial to get some patients out there. And his, his uh, thoughts were accurate, I think. He just said, uh, people aren't going to listen to any of us who have some enthusiasm for the project. Uh, what we need are a group of patients out there. And if we can change their lives, people are going to have to listen to them and start studying why this happens. And so we became part of the uh, first uh, national clinical trial on cochlear implants. And uh, early on, we looked for patients who had absolutely no hearing, um, had meningitis, or some problem where they had uh, developed speech and language concepts, but for some reason lost their hearing, and then had no residual hearing. Because uh, we knew that in that patient group, we couldn't make anything worse. They were already as bad as you could be. So we just had to show that we wouldn't have any surgical complications. And it didn't take long to get past that. But then there was a long string of events uh, showing that there was enough benefit to make it all worthwhile. But uh, th this was the beginning of the whole project where Bill House just uh, really uh, took uh, exception to all the experts and uh, decided we needed to explore this. And so all of us got a small group of uh, patients and we began to study them and find out uh, what was going on. And uh, early on, the signal was pretty simple, but uh, we had a technology that was changing people's lives. And when you had that, it just had to be explored. And so this, this was the beginning of the uh, cochlear implant project. Well, this is uh, how we got started. This is Riley Hospital at, um, in Indianapolis. Doug will recognize this place. He spent many hours there. But uh, we started uh, putting our team together. And uh, one of the problems that all of the implant investigators uh, found early on is none of the people who knew about deafness in young people and children uh, existed at medical centers. The, the medical profession just had so little to offer. So we had to little by little put together a team who could work with uh, these patients and then quantitate what was happening. What happened then, a bunch of uh, really excellent scientists start looking at coding strategies and how we can make the uh, external processor better. Uh, it went through some period of time where different electrode arrays were looked at, but uh, the surgical procedure is still fairly standard now compared to what it was uh, 20 years ago. So what we're actually putting in the ear hasn't changed a great deal, but a lot of advances have made in the sound processor. And uh, most of our patients who had these early implants have now had their processors upgraded. But this is a uh, graph of uh, some of Blake Wilson's early work where he worked out uh, some of the coding strategies that 
help people uh, get information from a cochlear implant. And what he did here, uh, this is a box diagram that looks kind of complicated, but basically it's just a way of uh, getting the signal into the ear so the electrical signals don't overlap, and that way we could get frequency information or the high, highs and lows would come through. Because we knew that uh, timing was pretty accurate. The device just has to be on or off, and the timing would come through fairly accurately. And to make it louder, you just make the signal bigger and smaller. But what was lacking in the early patients was the ability to distinguish frequencies. So Blake started uh, working out a number of strategies, and most of our current strategies are some uh, takeoff of uh, Blake Wilson's early CIS, uh, CIS strategy. He tested some early patients uh, that were using some of these, and these are best patients, but uh, the reason this became very important, for the first time, uh, some people who had been totally deaf were on various standardized uh, speech and hearing tests were performing at near normal levels. And uh, th this was just unheard of. When we started the implant project, I was very excited that we had patients who uh, could just hear a beep or a buzz and some things that helped their lip reading and with environmental sound contact. But all of a sudden, we start seeing patients who uh, really could understand speech with the uh, implants. So this uh, became the start of uh, really a whole new venture in terms of what we could do to make the processor as good as possible. What was very apparent though, there was an awful lot that could never be introduced through a cochlear implant, and this, this is still true. There, there were a number of things that uh, just cannot be introduced through a cochlear implant. Uh, we've got a limited number of electrodes, so the uh, strategies are mainly set up so that uh, people get information where speech is heard in the mid portion of the frequencies. But the uh, real fine details of the traveling way that goes on in the cochlea is, is absent. We don't really get that. And some of the sharpening of the membrane that normally occurs is absent. And a lot of the processing that goes along the auditory nerve isn't there. But if we can get enough key information in through the implant, uh, what most people really never thought about early on is that uh, the patient's brain is tremendously plastic and can take various types of information and uh, make a lot of sense out of it. And we learned this from our early patients because we put the device on there. When we first come in, we knew the device was working okay, but the patients weren't hearing very much uh, oftentimes. In fact, I had some patients say, well, doc, I gave up 10 years of deafness for this, and the signal really wasn't that good. But they would come back in a year, and it sort of sounded like their ear. And uh, the device wasn't doing anything differently. But they had basically retrained their brains to start processing the type of signal that would come through. So our thoughts were if the uh, key elements of speech were in there, they would learn to extract it. And that, that's exactly what we started seeing. So the, the next question was uh, working with uh, young children congenital or prelingually deafened children, we had to find out if there was enough information in the cochlear implant signal that they could extract the uh, type of information they needed to eventually uh, acquire speech perception skills, uh, produce speech normally so they're understandable, and develop actual language skills. So this is how our, our grants have been uh, uh, set up at the, for the last 20 years. Um, we really were uh, fortunate to have the support from NIH to start answering these questions. But uh, the reason the uh, implant project is working, the uh, patients kept doing better and better over time. And uh, from this, we learned how to improve the processor, and uh, we're continuing to see uh, continued improvement as the children uh, mature. Now, this is one of the very early uh, data slides that we had. Um, this is a uh, language slide, but it shows on the vertical axis uh, language age. This is on the test, and then on the horizontal axis, just chronological age. So if uh, patients are progressing uh, as they should, uh, they would pretty much uh, follow the diagonal. So that, that would be a, a normal tracing when your uh, language age is equivalent to your chronological age. Well, we took a, a group of uh, deaf kids who could get something from a hearing aid and just see where they were. But most of the deaf children would follow this dash line here. So their language growth was about half the rate of uh, normal children. And uh, that's pretty much standard if you can get something from a hearing aid. But then we start looking at uh, this closely and uh, 
this little line here shows what uh, we started seeing with our cochlear implant children. They were uh, improving at a rate that uh, exceeded what normal hearing uh, impaired kids would uh, achieve with their implants. Uh, and I, I looked at that, and their, their slope was very similar to uh, normal hearing, but because they had been deaf for a period of time, they had gotten behind, and uh, many of them never caught up, but they were learning at a more rapid rate. So I looked at this and I thought, well, one way of dealing with this is just lower the age at implantation and uh, provide sound earlier. So if, if they could continue to uh, acquire language skills at a pretty much normal rate, they weren't going to fall behind. And so we started looking at a lot of issues, but uh, age at implantation became one of the real important things that we looked at. So we started uh, decreasing the age at which uh, patients would become candidates. Well, we were uh, interested uh, around uh, uh, oh, the year 2000, just before that, the NIH got very interested in early detection of hearing loss and early intervention. And these are uh, some uh, summary slides that came out of all those early studies. Uh, we decided that all newborns should be screened for hearing loss by age one month. And uh, right now with uh, new tests, otoacoustic emissions and automated brainstem testing, uh, we know now that uh, kids can't hear when they're before they leave the nursery. So uh, diagnosis, at least finding a problem, is pretty standard. Uh, in fact, most of the states in the country now have mandatory newborn screening. So we can find them early. Uh, then next, uh, they wanted to make sure that some detailed audiometric assessment be done by age of three months, and then intervention by six months. Well, the problem with this was um, the FDA never came down that far. Uh, over the years, they gradually decreased their uh, selection criteria, but right now it's down to one year. So we still, if we can find babies uh, and do whatever's appropriate, there's still a gap before anything can be done. So we're trying to uh, change that at our center now. We set up um, an infant perception laboratory, and we have two infant researchers uh, on our team, uh, Derek Houston and Tanya Bergeson, who know how to assess deaf babies. That's what they do. And uh, they set up this laboratory. Um, they basically videotape the eye movements of uh, deaf children, and then we can uh, test their auditory uh, skills with uh, their cochlear implant uh, by watching their looking times. This is pretty well worked out with other types of infant research, but we converted into our um, implant patients, and we really were convinced that babies could uh, take advantage of uh, prosodic, uh, on and off type information and loudness. They really had the ability to make these types of distinctions. So uh, th this gave us some confidence to go ahead and start a, uh, a baby study in our program. So uh, in the year uh, 2000, uh, we had this mother called me. She was from uh, Augusta, Georgia. He says, we have a little guy here who was uh, needing a cochlear implant. And I says, well, tell me about him. He says, well, he failed his newborn screen. He had no old acoustic admissions, no brainstem response, and he's worn a hearing aid for three months, there's nothing. And he needs an implant. And I said, well, that kind of sounds like that's where we are. And uh, I said, well, how old is your little guy? And well, he was four months old. And at that time, the FD, I think they had lowered their age limit to 18 months, so we had this big gap there. But we decided we would launch into this baby study, and uh, I did his implant when he was six months old. And uh, but what we had to do, first of all, with all FDA studies that involve any procedure, you have to show it's safe, and that's number one. And then the second step is just that there's enough benefit to make it all worthwhile. But he, he was the one who started our uh, infant study here. and He was, uh, as I mentioned, six months old when we did it. Now this is the surgical technique I've used. <clears throat> We've, uh, babies, uh, Scalp is very thin, their skull is thin. You just have to be very careful with everything. But we have pediatric anesthesiologists at Riley Hospital, and we were uh, convinced that we could uh, do this uh, surgical procedure safely. And we knew he was deaf, uh, but we had to then demonstrate, once we got it in there, what would happen. But uh, th this technique has been pretty standard. I've used it in our older children and adults for a number of years now. We, we probably have done over 800 of them using this technique. So there's our little incision. It's about a four centimeter incision. It looks big here because the baby's head's so small, 
But uh, we're using the same device in these babies as in adults, so we have to be real careful with it, but we've had no problems with any of them. Now, the thing that um, is interesting, the, the cochlea is, is adult size when we're born. So the uh, development of the inner ear happens very rapidly. In fact, within the first trimester of pregnancy, the inner ear is pretty much there in its adult form. So the electrode we use is the same as in adults. Uh, the only thing that does change is that their uh, skull grows, so that uh, we have to take that into account. But th that's not been a, a problem. So we looked at uh, this early group that we've implanted between age uh, six months and a year. We've had no anesthetic complications. Um, have to be careful for post-operative uh, pulmonary problems, but that's not been a problem. And there have been no problems with the skin flap or incision and no facial nerve problems. So I think we're going to have to repeat this for the uh, FDA, but we've already done the safety phase of this. I think uh, if I can just uh, get similar results in our next batch for the FDA, then we'll try to uh, open this up to bigger uh, national clinical trial, which what we're trying to do is get the FDA to, to lower their age limit. And they're uh, interested in doing this as long as we can come up with the right data. So this is our little guy. Uh, had a little video here, but it just shows that he can definitely uh, uh, respond to sound with his implant. So we know the cues are there, and we just have to see what he can do with it. So anyway, we started looking at some of the children, and this uh, slide just shows some groupings we made, uh, looking at six-month intervals in these children. Uh, our study group is the, the first one up here, the ones implanted between uh, six and 12 months, but at each uh, six-month interval, we had a group for comparison, and they were all tested uh, two years after their implant. So this shows that their age at testing was a little different, but we wanted to make sure they all had uh, their implant to use for two years. And uh, on, on this, uh, the important bars, the, the one on the left here, you can see there our babies are, are clearly uh, having language quotients that are in excess of the ones who are implanted later. So I think uh, when you think about it, uh, nobody teaches us how to listen and speak. It, you just get tossed in your environment and uh, it happens. And uh, we think that if uh, children have the right input for their implant, uh, they can take advantage of just everything that's happening around them. We found that uh, most of the deaf children learn a lot of their uh, speech and language concepts just incidentally by participating in the world around them. And so this is why we think it's going to turn out to be very important to uh, introduce sound early if uh, it can't be achieved in any other way. Now, so this is what we concluded after this first little group of uh, young babies that we did. Uh, for sure, the cochlear implants in infants as young as six months uh, old is, are feasible because we've already done it uh, and no, no surgical complications. And what we're hoping is that uh, what they can achieve through their implant will be enough that uh, it'll facilitate their learning of uh, the speech sounds and eventually develop speech from that and uh, later on attach this to objects and other things in their environment. And so anyway, we think that this is ultimately going to uh, turn into a real language acquisition advantages. So anyway, we were able to bring back um, two of my first uh, babies that we did. Now they were tested then at the uh, uh, first one at age uh, eight years, nine months, and the second one at eight years, uh, two months. And uh, we uh, did some standard tests. The, Peabody picture vocabulary test and the self test are just standard language scores. But you can see here, um, both of these uh, early babies are, are age equivalent. Uh, here are their percentile scores. The first one is at the 45th percentile and the second at the 50th. But this is in comparison to uh, normal hearing kids. It's not compared to deaf kids. And uh, th this gives us a lot of confidence that they are going to be able to learn with their devices because we know that uh, a lot can be achieved by older patients, and we think the younger ones uh, should uh, do even better. Now this is uh, another little wing of the study. Uh, there are three little lines that basically just overlap, but it shows that uh, our two study patients were equivalent to uh, the normal language scores we're seeing here. Now one of the kids was in our baby study. We did the uh, implant at age seven months and uh, the sibling was implanted at age 18 months. Now you can see here, they both eventually uh, achieved uh, age equivalency, but 
what was very noticeable to the parents, um, the little one, the parents didn't do anything differently. They just let the kid just participate in whatever happened around the house. Whereas the older one, they, uh, they lived up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and drove all the way to uh, Milwaukee uh, twice a week to work with a therapist. And uh, they worked really hard to make it happen. So the, the child eventually got there, but it was so much more difficult with the uh, one implanted older. Uh, so we think that just by uh, getting the implant early, a lot of those types of difficulties can be averted. And we did this, there's a huge amount of variability among implant patients. So uh, we thought by implanting siblings at different ages, uh, it sort of gets it down to that one variable. And uh, it really gives us a lot of uh, optimism that early implantation is going to be a big help. Now, binaural hearing is another thing that's becoming important. Um, it's important to hear in both ears because we do better in noise. And uh, th this was kind of interesting. I wasn't too enthused about it early on because when you get one implant, the hearing's gonna come up. You do a second implant, it's just gonna come a little bit more. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe we're not gonna see a lot here, but actually the ones who've really been pushing for uh, hearing better in noise are educators and people around the um, children a lot because classrooms and wherever children are, it's always noisy and they can sort out sound much better if they have two implants. And uh, it's also important to localize sound. With one ear, you can't tell where the sound is coming from. But with two, they, most of them learn how to do that. And then, of course, you have the head shadow effect where your head screens out sound if your sound pickup is on the wrong side. So we've been working with this. Some of our uh, babies have been implanted bilaterally, and so they can take advantage of this right away. Now, we have to convince ourselves that there's no usable hearing in these babies, but uh, it doesn't take our audiologists uh, too, too many months to figure that out. And then we have some children who have one ear that's clearly in implant territory, and they get a little something with a hearing aid, so a few of them are wearing a hearing aid in the other ear. And so it's uh, kind of an interesting thing to look at. So we have, this is one of our first little guys who had bilateral implants. And we now have several of our children who have two implants. Uh, but we had to, first of all, just convince ourselves that uh, nothing else was going to be helpful. Because I don't think implants are going to change a great deal in the next uh, oh, several years here. And I think uh, if we get beyond that time, we sort of ex uh, exceed the time where the rapid learning that all children experience uh, kind of goes away. There are some critical ages. Uh, now, it's hard to define them. I think everybody still thinks they're still learning, and we all think we're learning. So I think there isn't a time when it stops, but clearly uh, learning does slow down. And these young children are learning at such unbelievable rates, so we're trying to take advantage of that. So I just wanted to, uh, this doesn't have much to do with the implant project, but I just wanted to tell you about this, uh, where this is all going. Um, we don't know this for sure, but um, there's a lot of interest in uh, scientific circles of regenerating the inner ear. And we actually had some patients thinking, well, maybe we ought to just wait out, because uh, in a little while, maybe scientists will be able to regenerate hair cells in the cochlea, or they'll develop stem cells that uh, will turn into something. But I think uh, the, the research is quite a ways down the road. Uh, we actually have Dr. Uh, Ariyashina in our laboratory who's doing stem cell research. And we actually uh, have shown some progress, but I think it's a long time before um, a human study is going to be available. And I think that uh, if you wait on this type of research, uh, we may outlive our chance to take care of this rapid learning that the children experience. But uh, what's happening, uh, we uh, did this project with uh, uh, Dr. Akira Matsuoka. He actually injected uh, stem cells into the uh, medialis of the cochlea. So we got a little needle here, and we could uh, do, uh, this is in an animal model. We can see a little uh, bird just making a hole in the cochlea. And through this, we could inject uh, stem cells into the cochlea. And uh, th this shows in uh, the little markers here. Those are stem cells that are actually growing in the medialis of uh, uh, an animal model. So we know it can be done. And then uh, what was done next is uh, injecting the inner ear and just seeing what happens here. And you see these uh, stem cells 
have actually migrated up the uh, cochlea. And uh, this, so you can imagine here that uh, possibly uh, the stem cell project could be uh, combined with uh, a cochlear implant down the line. So we're, we're looking at all these things, but um, there, there may come a time where uh, dealing with implants uh, is going to be a different thing, where we can create a more favorable biologic environment, which uh, would be another quantum leap. So anyway, what we've seen so far, there are lots of results that we just thought would be totally unimaginable. Uh, back when I finished my fellowship with Bill House, uh, most of the experts in uh, otolaryngology just thought the project would never succeed. And it, we owe a tremendous amount of, to Bill House just to forge ahead. Uh, it'd be difficult to do that now, but uh, he just uh, had the idea that something was going to happen here. And we have uh, adults and young children doing things that we just never thought would be appropriate. So where we're going with our program, we're looking at uh, age and implantation as one of the key variables. So we're uh, doing this younger and younger. And then also uh, patients with a lot of residual hearing are being implanted because we feel they can do better with an implant than what they can with their current hearing aids. So all these things are being explored. So we'll just have to see where this is all going, but uh, certainly uh, in the words of William House, we really have entered a new era in otology. Well, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to ask uh, Michelle Van Gordon to come. She's going to update you on uh, some of the current results we've been seeing with our implant patients, because uh, it is a project that keeps getting more and more exciting as we go forward. So we, we know we can do it safely, but uh, Michelle will share with you uh, some of the results she's been seeing, and uh, this has really made the uh, project come alive, and it's uh, got a long way to go, but we're learning from our patients every day. So Michelle will ask you to update the group on uh, what you've been seeing. Thank you, Dr. Miyamoto. So today I would like to talk about cochlear implant candidacy a little bit more detail than Dr. Miyamoto talked about, some outcomes that we're seeing, and if we have time, a few case studies. As Dr. Miyamoto said, the criteria for cochlear implantation has expanded over the years. In the 80s, only adults who were postlingually deafened with a profound hearing loss were considered, and this has progressed to include children at the age of two years, and adults and children who were pre- and postlingually deafened, and even those that still had some residual hearing. And it was at one time that we would only consider someone for an implant if they had no open set speech understanding with hearing aids. But now we will consider someone for a cochlear implant if they can perceive less than 50% on a sentence test or in children less than 30% on a word test. This is an audiogram showing cochlear implant candidacy for adults and children. And to familiarize you with the audiogram, on the horizontal scale from left to right is the frequencies going from low to high pitch. And on the vertical axis is the volume going from very soft to very loud sounds. So we are looking at patients who do have some residual hearing in the moderate hearing loss range, sloping down to a profound hearing loss range. And this is without their hearing aids. The candidacy that we were talking about so far was for a standard cochlear implant, but presently there are FDA trials looking at patients who do not benefit enough from a traditional hearing aid but are not quite a standard cochlear implant candidate. For these patients, they are receiving a cochlear implant and also using a hearing aid in the same ear, taking advantage of the low frequency hearing that is saved from the cochlear implant surgery. I am one of six cochlear implant audiologists at the Med Center, and we see patients for cochlear implant evaluations over a two-day process. During this process, they are seen for a cochlear implant hearing aid evaluation for a CT and or MRI scan. They're seen by Dr. Miyamoto for a medical evaluation. They're also seen for a cochlear implant orientation where we talk in depth about what a cochlear implant is, expectations, rehabilitation with a patient and their family for about two and a half to three hours. Also a cognitive assessment. We may um, refer to another department within the hospital system. 
and they also may participate in the DePaul Research Laboratory in some of the studies that Dr. Miyamoto discussed. I'm going to go into detail about what is completed at our cochlear implant um, evaluation. There are several tests that are completed on that day. We do complete audiograms with their hearing aids and without their hearing aids. We do check the hearing aids to make sure that they're appropriately fit, they're appropriately working. Sometimes we do have to send patients back to their hearing aid audiologist to have them checked, adjusted, try new hearing aids because they weren't appropriate. We also check the middle ear through tympanometry and acoustic reflexes. We'll complete speech perception testing, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. We'll complete otoacoustic emissions and possibly an ABR or vestibular testing. So speech perception testing is one of the most important tasks that we do pre and post operatively with our cochlear implant patients. It is what we use to determine candidacy prior to implantation. It lets us know if the patient's technology is appropriate. And it also lets us know if a patient has access to all of the sounds across the speech range or what sounds specifically they're missing. We can also monitor changes over time. The speech perception tests that we do vary by age in the auditory skill development. There are very various questionnaires that we use. Um, oftentimes this is for young children, and this is questionnaires from their parents on their observations of their auditory skills. And we also have standardized closed and open set tests that we complete. There are several factors that we consider when looking at a patient for a cochlear implant candidacy, and we want to look at them as a whole and just not as a set of ears. Um, we see patients with various different audiological, medical, and developmental histories, and many of these patients have become successful CI users. Um, we have patients with cochlear malformations, such as the Mondini malformation, Down syndrome, syndrome CHARGE, um, auditory neuropathy, um, Connexin 26, just to name a few. When considering candidacy, we want to first look, do they meet the audiological criteria for a cochlear implant? Um, were there any concerns that developed as we were completing the testing? So did we find out that they're not wearing the hearing aids consistently at home? Um, is there not a strong family support? Do they not have the therapies that they need? Um, and also, what is the mode of communication? Do they need a cochlear implant to reach their communication goal? As I mentioned, we go talk to the family for about two and a half to three hours about expectations and how a cochlear implant works. And we want to make sure that the expectations are realistic. We want them to know that this isn't an instant fix for their child or loved one. We also want to look at which ear are we going to implant. Are we going to recommend one implant now and potentially an implant down the road, um, simultaneous cochlear implantation, or a hearing aid and cochlear implant together? From experience, we know that there are several variables that do affect performance. This is the age of onset of deafness, um, how old they were when they got an implant, um, do they use a hearing aid prior to implantation and how much hearing did they have when using that hearing aid? Um, etiology, did they have meningitis? Was there some ossification of the cochlea? Um, are there any other factors that should be considered and is their therapy appropriate? Some things that we knew that do not affect performance is device. There are presently three cochlear implant manufacturers that are approved in the United States. And they vary in the number of electrodes on their array, but we know that as long as there's greater than six electrodes in the cochlea, the patients do well. Next, I want to go over some outcomes. We see our patients for quite a bit in the first year that they have their cochlear implant, and we've broken down our schedule. Um, for those who are under five years old and those who are over five years old. And this is a schedule for when they see the cochlear implant audiologists. We see them at, for initial stimulation, which is the first time that they hear with the cochlear implant, and this occurs four to six weeks after surgery. We do see them over two days because this is a comprehensive visit where we're taking many measurements and going over equipment and counseling the family. 
They are then seen for a two week, a one month, a three month, a six month, and a one year appointment. And then we follow them every six months from there on. For our older populations, we see them for almost the same schedule except for the two week appointment and then we follow them for one year intervals. These are important appointments because we can often find if the patient's not making the expected amount of progress, do we need to change rehab recommendations um, and answer any questions. So Dr. Miyamoto introduced you to how a cochlear implant works. And to have good outcomes with an implant, we need to know that all of the components are working properly. We need to know that the microphone on the external processor is functioning, that the cable coil is able to transmit the signal to the internal device so that there are no shorts in the cable, and also that the internal electrode is working okay. Every time a patient comes to see us, we take measurements of the internal device to make sure that there are no open or short circuits. But the cochlear implant is the tool that provides access um, for sound, but it's not what does all the work. We have to remember that the brain is doing the work for the understanding of the speech and making of the progress. With our pediatric patients, we are only one small part of the team that is working for them to reach their outcomes and the best possible outcomes for them. There should be involved parents or caregivers, the surgeon, the audiologist, a speech language pathologist, and then possibly an interpreter or a resource assistant at school, and their teachers. And it's important that we have open communications with everyone to know what is going on. I wanted to give you an idea of some expectations depending on the communication mode and the age of implantation um, for children with cochlear implants. These are very conservative um, expectations. I would say that we often see that patients do much more than this. This first one is for children who receive a cochlear implant at a young age and are also using auditory oral communication. By one year, they are receptively understanding quite a bit of spoken language and are also expressing some words. This next group is children who had some residual hearing aid and used a hearing aid prior to getting a cochlear implant and are also using oral communication. They tend to make some progress a little bit faster because their brain knows what language is and they're a little bit more familiar with that. And this is a group that maybe didn't have consistent hearing aid use at home, um, didn't have a, or didn't go to therapy and didn't have a lot of experience and also may use some sign language in addition to spoken communication. Their progress is a little bit slower and they don't understand as much um, in an open set. So if something's familiar, they may understand a little bit more. On all of our patients, we once again complete speech perception testing to look at how they're doing. Are they benefiting from their current technology? Are we going to recommend um, maybe a new sound processor if one's available on the market? Um, are there concerns about their internal device? If something is going on with the internal device, we may see decreases in speech perception scores over the years. And we can also make recommendations for school and for therapy. I'd like to share some of our patients with you and show you how they are doing with their cochlear implants. Our first is a patient who came to us when she was 56 years old. She had a history of a progressive hearing loss that started when she was around 17 and she started wearing hearing aids in both ears at the age of 21. Um, when she first came to us for her preoperative testing, her scores in quiet on sentences was 78%, which doesn't quite meet the candidacy criteria. But we know with sentences, if you just miss one word, you can probably fill in the blank and know what that word is. So she had great what we call closure skills. But if we look at her scores in noise and on words, on words she was only getting 18% of what was presented to her. So we decided to go forward with a cochlear implant. And at six months, she had reached the ceiling on some of the tests and increased her word score from 18 to 76%. The second recipient is a child who was diagnosed at one 
month of age, so that's good for that early newborn hearing screening, um, that was fit with hearing aids at four months, the parents had chosen a communication goal of oral communication, and they received a cochlear implant at one year. So on your left is an audiogram showing their responses in the sound booth before um, cochlear implantation, and in fact, they didn't respond at all with their hearing aids or without their hearing aids. On your right is their audiogram with their cochlear implant. They are responding between 20 and 30 decibels, which is equal to a mild hearing loss range, and are hearing all frequencies across the speech range equally. This is exactly where we want someone to be. To kind of show you their scores, at pre-op on a parent questionnaire of how they're responding with their hearing aids, the parent scored a four out of a 40. And then at 18 months post implant, we're up to 37 out of 40 on the parent questionnaire. And at four years post, 100% of words um, on what are considered easy words and 80% on hard words. So that's excellent progress. And for a five-year-old to sit through all that testing. The third recipient um, has a history of hearing loss since birth, um, known to the Connexin 2630 gene variant, was fit with hearing aids at two months of use, or of age, sorry, and had limited benefit. Um, this child received two cochlear implants at the same time at age eight months, and also in oral communication. So once again on the left, no responses in the audiogram before surgery and on the right, beautiful responses with a cochlear implant right where we would expect. This is just a quick score to show that the parents quickly saw a change when they were giving their questionnaires and reached ceiling on relatively easy tasks. But it's fun to hear the parents report what they're saying at home. So at three months, when this kiddo was 11 months old, was localizing to sounds, had a huge growth in receptive vocabulary at six months post CI, um, kept on learning, and this is very unusual, but at two years post CI, so he'd be two years and eight months, he was discharged from speech therapy because he was advanced in all areas compared to his normal hearing peers. Um, and he's currently learning, Eng or he knows English, and he's currently learning Spanish and Hebrew. So not all the recipients that we see use spoken communication. This is an example of a kiddo that uses argumentative or alternative communication. An example of this is picture pointing, uh, maybe using a computer to speak for you or to communicate. Um, and we saw this kiddo when they were 11 months old. They were born at 24 weeks. There were severe global developmental delay, delays, um, history of cerebral palsy. We did complete ABR testing, which is an objective test that showed and confirmed a profound hearing loss. And the parents reported no observed benefit from a hearing aid. So we decided to proceed with one cochlear implant. Um, they, this child can detect the ling sounds, which are sounds that represent the speech range and alerts to environmental sounds. Now on the audiogram, it doesn't look nice and flat between 20 and 40 like our other kiddos did that I showed. And that this could be for several reasons, for the developmental delays that they're not able to tell us the softest they hear in the sound booth because it's really not that exciting just to listen to a beep over and over. Um, and it could be that just isn't interested in the task. But the parents are happy with the progress, and so we would say that this is successful because they have reached their goals for cochlear implantation. And I want to thank you for your time. Well, first of all, do we have any questions for Dr. Miyamoto or, or for Michelle? I may have a question. Is Can you comment, Dr. Miyamoto on, or Michelle, on the current status of uh, insurance reimbursement for, for cochlear implants now? Is that a difficult challenge, or is it getting better and better? Or? Uh, is my little mic on? I'll, I'll just stay right here. Uh, it's on. Yeah, the insurance has been a real issue here. Um, when we started the study, uh, insurance didn't cover anything. So we just had to get some patients through the process. But then when the FDA got involved, they set sort of limits. And we have to 
address that because most of the insurance carriers are following FDA guidelines right now. But as we are getting scientific information that kind of proves that earlier is better and different types of uh, hearing loss are appropriate, we're going to have to do the right kinds of studies to uh, have the FDA change their national guidelines. And we have uh, Anthem WellPoint is the largest carrier in the country right now. It's right in Indianapolis, about a half mile from us. <clears throat> and uh, they're turning down all our little kids because they say, well, this is what FDA says. And so we're trying to do the right studies just to document improvement in all these areas. But yeah, insurance has been one of the uh, major deterrents uh, through the whole process here. <clears throat> but uh, we're trying to get enough data that uh, have our patients start doing things to document it's the right thing to do. And it's, it's gradually loosening up. We're doing a lot better than we used to. But uh, we started the project, no one even heard of an implant. So we had to start at square one there. But uh, what's happening now, the way a lot of these questions will get answered is our patients will start doing things that they could never do before. And it's really starting to happen. That's great. In, oh, Bob. Oh, you're from Chelsea. So bottom line, in 2012, all the babies that are born with a congenital profound hearing loss and no other issues, how many of them will be ready to enter the school system with their cochlear implants at the age of five? Yeah. That, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, I think that so much of uh, their success is going to depend on what exists around them. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we worked very hard to get an oral deaf school in Indianapolis. <clears throat> I uh, got, finally got St. Joseph's uh, from St. Louis to put a satellite in Indianapolis. Uh, they looked at us a number of years ago and they decided to go to uh, Kansas City first. But actually we took advantage of that because a lot of the uh, pitfalls of setting up satellite schools kind of happened in Kansas City. So they had it figured out by the time they came. But what we're hoping is that a real high percentage of kids implanted early, if they're in the right educational environment, be ready to be mainstreamed. And actually, a very high percentage of St. Joe's early kids are uh, going to be mainstreamed. So if, if you're able to take advantage of just your normal educational setting and live at home and learn language like kids usually do, we're going to have a lot of successes. But <clears throat> that, that's a good question, and uh, this has to be played out. Uh, Right now, we're having big uh, discussions with our deaf school. You know, they really don't want this to happen. They just soon teach them American Sign Language and not have them participate. But the, the real issue is 90% uh, of the deaf kids in the world are in hearing families, the siblings and the rest of the family here. So if possible, the family will want them to be in their world. Now, I actually tried to learn American Sign Language. Uh, I don't know if you did, but it's hard. Uh, <laughs> It's like learning a second language, but you also have to be coordinated doing it. And uh, it's difficult. And uh, what we find is many of our families who tried to learn another way of communicating uh, aren't very good at it. And so you're trying to teach your child a second language that you're not very good at. Well, you can't expect the child to excel in it. So I think that for most people, uh, they're going to want to get uh, their child prepared so they can get into a mainstream situation. But I think it, uh, what we're seeing now, it's going to be a high percentage. But the, the first ones in the process are just now launching out into regular school. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And we're lucky with today's technology in that therapy for patients who live far away from like St. Joseph's in Indiana can be done over a program such as Skype where the therapist at the home school, but you have to have the parents who are involved and willing to dedicate their time or through distance learning. Yeah, I was talking about uh, how this is going to get resolved because I, I was uh, president of the school board at St. Joseph, which is our oral school, and I spent about 10 years on the board of our other deaf school, and these people just can't ever agree on anything. And uh, I finally figured out the professionals really aren't going to change their attitudes. Uh, they just aren't going to do it. But the way that these tricky issues are going to be resolved is we're going to have a whole group of young people telling their own story real soon because it's starting to happen now. Rhonda? Um, if you have an adult with uh, one uh, unilateral hearing loss, would a, would a cochlear implant be helpful and how, does it, how long does it take to adapt to that when you have one hearing ear and one not? The cochlear implant. That is something that's being investigated in other countries and very 
few in the United States. Um, with insurance, they look at the whole, the best aided condition, and so if they have normal hearing in one ear and hearing loss in the other, they will most likely see ling on all the tests that we can give. Um, are you referring to someone that has normal hearing in one ear and hearing loss in the other? Pardon? Are you referring to somebody who has hearing? Well, me. Yeah, okay. she is yeah. referring to yeah. someone. Okay. I know who yes. it is. <laughs> it's herself. Um, so. <laughs> It is. Like the same a lot of people report that it sounds like Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, very robotic. So there's a long adjustment period for it. Would it help such a person? Yeah, in the United States, we really hadn't been doing those, but uh, a doctor in Belgium started doing these a number of years ago, mainly for tinnitus. But uh, he's reporting good results. So it, it may uh, become more common soon, but what has to happen, the implant has to approach a normal hearing ear a little better than what it does right now to be mainstream. But uh, some people are helped to have a unilateral hearing loss like this. And with new technology, aren't you going to be able to maybe make more, instead of two little electrodes or three, 1,000 like you have up there, maybe 30,000 like hair cells? Well, we're, we're hoping that the implants are going to get better, but I think that uh, the engineers are sort of uh, getting to the limits of what they can do because it, it is an artificial system. And uh, you know, sure, there, there are a lot of uh, shortfalls with current implants versus what a normal ear looks like. And we're certainly not there yet. Question. Are there any, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any complications, particularly vestibular complications? Uh, that was a concern. In fact, when I started doing the implants with Bill House uh, years ago, we did ENGs, test, tested their vestibular system, and uh, uh, surprisingly, there isn't much difficulty with the vestibular system. <clears throat> I think we finally decided that it probably happened the uh, rate of stimulation of the vestibular system is much slower than the auditory system, and so it didn't seem to bother us much. But there is that risk. We occasionally do have some people who have some... Uh, dizziness problems, but if it occurs, uh, our patients usually just describe it rather short term, and then they accommodate. So it really hasn't been that much of a problem. Uh, how about, is there any role for uh, patients that have a medication-induced, like an ototoxic drug or medication-induced hearing loss, that roll with uh, uh, cochlear implants in adult patients? See, what was the question again? So a patient that uh, has a, an ototoxic event with the medication, for example, and loses hearing, uh, is it, 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 are they able to receive cochlear implants and improve their hearing? Yeah, we, we have quite a few patients who have ototoxic deafness. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, cancer drugs uh, have ototoxic properties, and uh, if uh, you have anything that... Uh, eliminates the function of the inner ear, they usually do well. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's a little bit variable. We, we have uh, some patients with ototoxic medicines that don't lose everything, and they haven't done as well as we thought, so there's more that needs to be found out about that. But uh, th that is a, a group of patients that if they lose their hearing, uh, their, their auditory nerve should be working, and this should work. Okay. Oh, question. Uh, <clears throat> I don't mean to be crass in terms of speaking the dollars and cents of this, but I think we as physicians are often uh, very uneducated about how much our prescriptions cost, and we're flabbergasted <clears throat> when we go to the pharmacy and find out that some drug that we ourselves are getting, uh, you know, if we have to pay for it, it costs a lot more than we had any idea. So I'm going to ask about the cost of cochlear implant. I was involved in some of the uh, issues that you talked about several years ago, and I think it was about $50,000 to $100,000 per cochlear implant. I'm, I'm wondering, has the price gone up, gone down? Has, have we been able to, through new technologies, uh, reduce the cost, or where are we now on this? Because uh, it, it comes down to an issue also of, of uh, what can we afford to do for how many people? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, we thought when we got uh, FDA approval for these things, the cost would come down. Well, <clears throat> it really hasn't. Um, and the reason for this, all these companies are having to recoup their uh, research and development costs. <clears throat> so instead of coming down, it stayed pretty much where it was. So now, right now, the companies are charging about $36,000 for an implant. <clears throat> then you have the, the usual costs of uh, an operating room, recovery room, usually a night in the hospital, and so on. So those are pretty standard. But uh, 
Yeah, as opposed to uh, what we thought when we got FDA approval that the cost would come down, they really haven't. Um, and I, I can't fault the companies for it because they're trying to recoup a lot of their initial uh, investment into this whole thing. So, What's the cost of being deaf? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, the, 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 the mm -hmm. option of uh, some intervention that can change your whole life, uh, it, it's a pretty insignificant thing, but it's hard to get insurance companies to look at that. We've been trying to get them to appreciate if we can have <clears throat> kids uh, go to a regular school instead of a deaf school, that's a huge saving. And uh, we just had a big demonstration in our state house because uh, <clears throat> our governor is trying to make some of these things happen about how the screening is done. And obviously the state funding is all gone for the state school for the deaf and they don't want to change their budget. And they were all demonstrating at our governor's well, actually at the Capitol, they had a huge number of them, uh, but it, it's gonna happen. And if we can get kids so they can uh, go to a regular school, that's gonna be a huge saving. Rick, question? I think one of the most important things to consider in these children, it makes the difference between a normal life or a life uh, confined to the deaf culture. These. Uh, in our society, the deaf people don't fit in. They're totally excluded. And with this miracle, they can hold a job. Deaf people are practically unemployable. They don't communicate. They're segregated to special groups. And the cost is very small to give a person a life. And like was mentioned, they don't even communicate in their own family. They go to family events like Thanksgiving and they're excluded. They have to go to a separate ward. I mean, it it's gives them a whole life. So these things are absolute miracles. And I think they're less money than a penile implant. <laughs> so <laughs> have to see where it fits in. <laughs> Probably changes their life more than a implant. <laughs> yeah, I, I just got a, 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 Wendy Myers, one of our uh, clinical audiologists, who's been with me since the beginning, uh, sent Michelle and I an email from one of our patients who was one of the very early kids we implanted. Uh, he uh, has one of the early versions of the 22 channel device, but uh, I, I sort of lost track. I mean, he's a real behavior problem because he couldn't hear and couldn't communicate, and it was just a real problem. But they finally got him going. And I sort of lost track of him a few years ago, but he's now a uh, practicing attorney in Ohio. And <clears throat> it, it's hard, it's going to be real hard to say these things just don't work after a while. I just was hoping that you might be able to speak more to the, to the controversy regarding this. I mean, the, the other guest or, or the person that asked the last question kind of alluded to some of the issues, but I mean, there's large deaf communities, Rochester, New York, that have, you know, entire communities functioning very well, where some of the parents would be uh, quite unwilling to have their children with a cochlear implant. And what's your feelings regarding that? Well, I, I think that there's a real need for both approaches to this whole thing. Um, so far, in our program, we've never implanted a uh, deaf child who has two deaf parents who are in that culture, because <clears throat> I think they already have the culture of their family, uh, and I, I think it fits in real well there. But as I mentioned, 90% of the deaf kids in this world are in hearing families, so it, it takes the right kind of environment. And the other thing, our deaf school is taking on a lot of the uh, multiply handicapped kids that don't fit in anywhere else, so they, they're getting a tough population. But uh, our team has always taken the attitude that both approaches are really needed, but you have to have the right approach for each family. And uh, I think that's going to be changing. As, uh, it didn't matter if we had the ability to find kids if we had no intervention, but we do have a way to intervene now. And, uh, we can't really uh, eliminate all the uh, variability we've seen because some of the kids don't do as well as others. But that's true of normal hearing people. We've got a big range of performance. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just give people their best opportunity. And anyone who is objecting to this, I tell them, if you want to be deaf again, just turn it off. You're deaf again. <laughs> and so we haven't really eliminated that option. 
Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. I think now there's a break with the exhibitors. I encourage you all to meet with them. <laughs>